Right, so I just wanted to point out that the one mind was at work because both Carol chose words which were totally appropriate to what I want to speak about this morning without either of us being aware, and you know this happens over and over, and I never had an opportunity to read the response of reading before this morning, and it speaks exactly to what I want to speak about. And so I want to welcome not only us who are here in this room, but also to those who may be listening on the World Wide Web. And I'm inviting all of you to share with your um, friends and associates, wherever they may be in the world, ask them to tune in and enjoy our services because it comes across very, very clear when we have streaming, and they will enjoy just being here with us. So my talk this morning is stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. One of the least understood statements, I believe, that is widely used is when you pray, shuffle your feet. And another, which to my mind has no merit whatsoever, is if you want good, your nose must run. The first statement suggests that we should waste no time into jumping into action, putting our goals into intention and actions, and intentions into action once we have expressed our desires in prayer. We should jump in and start working at it. Now, yes, it is true that getting into action may in fact prove to be a catalyst for the change we seek. So there is merit in this approach, but often in the heat of the moment, or of the crisis that led us to prayer, we stumble without clear direction. As for our nose running, it is a well-intentioned form of encouragement to make great efforts, take action towards one's goal. As far as I'm concerned, it introduces a risk of fatalistic belief in hardship and suffering. Fortunately, this is almost never said anymore. Jesus the Christ showed us in his masterpiece demonstration of the healing power of God when he lifted up Lazarus from what he said was not death, but in fact proved to be death according to human eyes and nose. A very delightful little book, The Lazarus Blueprint, by Mary Alice and Richard Jaffola, was stunning in its clarity and simplicity and is highly recommended for all students of the science of mind as a personal guide to how to approach any situation which may seem like a crisis. Jesus was a great friend of the siblings, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. The story is told in John 11 verses 1 to 44 that Jesus got a message from the sisters saying that Lazarus was ill and they needed help his help. Jesus told his disciples when he got the message, this sickness will not end in death, and carried on with whatever he was doing, which was preaching and healing, and I am sure spending time in the silence, as he was wont to do. When he finally decided to arrive in Bethany, Lazarus had been dead for three days. Now the rest of the story is legendary. And I'm not going to tell you all of the story. I'm inviting you to go to read it 
and read it very carefully. The, those familiar with the story will remember that Jesus, ignoring the appearance of death, cried out, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus, who was already dead and stinking, came forth out of the tomb. But before that, they asked, roll away the stone. Now this entire story is filled with metaphors. And I'm only using the very first part of the story for the purpose of my talk this morning. Because you will notice that this very good friend of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, when he was called to come to his friend, he took three days to come. Now if your friend called you and said, I am sick, would you take three days? Would you? Oh, I don't want you to criticize Jesus, you know, but would you take three days, right? Well, Jesus did. And he apparently had a very good reason. Because he wanted to demonstrate something which had never been done before as far as humans know. Also, in this story, and to my mind, a very plausible explanation, is that Jesus himself, knowing the magnitude of what he was about to do, recognized what was happening and wanted time to go within, to be still, to stand still, and behold the glory of God. I think he also did what was very, very clear that each of us should do when faced with a challenging situation. It is very tempting to be so absorbed in the situation that we can't think of anything else in the moment. So what in fact Jesus did was to spend time to turn away from the situation turn away. He went on with his business of what he was doing and he turned away to turn within because we know how much time he spent going within. So for us, whenever we have any situation that perturbs us and the image of it fills our mind and we feel that not equal to the task, we can engage in anything. What I do sometimes, I call it no-brainers. I go on the internet and I might look at, um, you know, Family Feud or one of these other very light, entertaining um, things on TV. I go read a book which is uplifting. You can read the Bible. You can read any of our books. You can go and play a game with a child because children bring out that in you. Do anything in that moment that will take your attention away in that instant from the challenge. But most important, be still and behold the glory of the Lord. Be still. How much time do we spend being still? Most of the time when I, I invite people to spend 20 minutes, even 10 minutes, morning and evening, just turning up just sit down, be there, not praying, not reading, not begging God for anything, just being there, not even trying to listen, just be still, just permit, and not trying to relax either. Just allow yourself to be still, and in that practice of being still, the, 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 the beholding of the glory of the God will become a natural practice. I'm not saying it is easy thing to do initially, but it is necessary and it is the first thing to do when we face any challenge. So I'm inviting you, John 11 verses 1 to 4, take the story, read it very carefully, invite it to teach you what Jesus was doing in his blueprint, his masterpiece, where he showed us how to meet what we call big problems or little problems or just facing life. Pharaoh, 
Pharaoh pursued the Israelites as they were being led out of Egypt by Moses. We know on seeing the oncoming threat, the people started to blame Moses and said, you should have left me where I was. It is better that I stay there in bondage than come here and face death because he saw the chariots coming after them. And immediately, they started to lose heart. You know, sometimes we treat, and when we treat, it doesn't seem as if the treatment is working. It seems sometimes as if things might be going worse, getting worse. But in fact, if we treat, it is not getting worse. We are just learning the lessons that we need to learn in order that we may be transformed to become the consciousness that will lead us to what we want to experience. So, Moses, do you know what Moses said? Stand still and behold the glory of the Lord. Stand still. He managed to say it with enough conviction, with enough force, and with enough spiritual authority because he was tuned in. He lived from that place of standing still as a habit. And so when he said it, they obeyed him. And the rest, I'm sending you all to your Bibles. But those who remember Sunday school, the rest is history, right? That was the beginning, the first part, and the first challenge that was met. It was crossing of the, they call it Red Sea, it's Reed Sea, right? Well, some people may challenge whether in fact it, things took place as they did, but it is not in our teaching to do that. It's in our teaching to take the message from it. And the message says that whenever we meet a challenge, stand still and behold the glory of God. Dr. Ernest Holmes, from, in, from the question and answers on the signs of man, that's why I took this. He, asked, he answered quite a few questions, and I took two of them, which I found very relevant. And the question was, I have an objective as to what I want to be, but I cannot form a definite objective of what I ought to do. I have a multitude of things before me that I might try to do, but cannot settle on the one thing I should do. How can I overcome this confusion? First of all, once you see it as confusion, you're going to get more confusion. But he was very polite, and he said, he went on to answer. He said, since you cannot choose one activity over the others, give the problem to mind. Say something like this, and I'm going to read it slowly. I know that the divine mind within me knows what particular work is for me to do. It knows the right activity to bring about what I want. I rely on it to open the way, to show me the sign that points to the right action. I realize this divine guidance is within me now and that activi this activity works through me and cannot be withheld from my affairs. And he said, having said something like that to yourself, which immediately acknowledges the divine mind and knows that that divine mind is at work within us, then we must then be in a point of surrender, rely on it to show us a sign so that we may be pointed in right action. And having recognized that sign and about to act upon it, we must remember consistently 
that this divine guidance is within us now and always, and it is working through us, and that it cannot be withheld from our affairs. And he said, then watch for the sign. Just go about your business. Forget about it. Go about your business. It don't mean watch looking for every little thing. Go about your business and you'll recognize the sign when you see it. There will become a quietness within you because you'll have spent time in the quiet. And that inner voice will speak to you. You know, having recited those words, you will choose words like that which become the seed that it's like a mental seed that is planted within the mind which then takes it. It has no choice but to take it and act upon it. And it will guide you, it will direct you, and it will govern you, and it will point you and take you resolutely in the direction of liberty and freedom. He says, and with it, peace, success, and happiness. You know, it reminds me always of the simplicity of the lesson that comes when we plant a seed. We plant a seed and it is embraced by the warm soil. And this warm soil is filled with nutrients that we cannot see. And it takes the seed and it works upon it in the dark, some, when we can't, where we can't see it, but we have enough faith to recognize that something is happening because we know by understanding faith that when you plant a seed, it will grow. In the same way we know by understanding faith that when we plant an idea squarely into mind, recognizing that that mind is the one mind of God in us as us, and it works according to law, meaning it doesn't need any help from us, and it has no choice but to do for us what we demand it to do. You know, I personally, and maybe you too, have been witnessing around us the evidence of great restlessness at every level. Some people are expressing very candidly that there is a personal urge to do and to be more. There is on a national level a lot of movement and there is on a global level a lot of movement too. And it may, if we are not securely grounded, we may be picking up some of the energy of it and feeling restlessness rather than the enthusiasm and excitement of change. It is the nature of life that there be constant change, yet the pace of change seems to pick up speed at intervals, as it seems to be doing now. On a cosmic level even, scientists have observed a huge chunk of our sun which seems to have been torn away. So there's a big gap in the sun that has been a stable factor in the, we just take it for granted. Our life here on earth depends on it. Yet in a, one of the major solar um, flares, you know the sun is constantly, it's feeding gently energy to us, which is keeping us the way we are, safe and healthy. But it also, from time to time, lives, gives off big bursts of energy, which I call solar flares. flares. And in one of them, a huge chunk of the sun seemed to have been blown off. So there was a big dark spot. And even as I speak, our little country is, is just repeating, history is repeating itself, as many uh, contemplating, migrating to other countries in the expectation of escaping some threat, real or imagined. Some are just ready for something bigger, something more exciting, out there, wherever out there is. Many are just 
plane in search of a better life. And what if the better life is where you are? What if everything is as safe and as anywhere? Everywhere is as safe as anywhere. What if? What if? What if has no purchase in the mind of God? Everyone has a gift of choice, and anyone can and should choose to experience life fully and completely and wherever they wish to and whatever they wish to do, as Mr. Bolt is choosing to do by beginning training as an amateur, ecstatically training as a footballer, starting from scratch with his usual confident self. But it seemed to disturb some people that he should be doing that. Everyone is permitted to choose how they want to experience life and wherever they wish to and whatever they wish to do. But it is good to stop a while, be still and recognize the source of all wisdom and invite it into our deliberations and plans. By all means, set goals, but remember from whence cometh our help. One of the most difficult decisions some people are faced with making is to remove themselves from a relationship that has outgrown its original intent. I have witnessed people struggle with the idea. The what if comes into play to bind them when their heart says leave. Others think their fading relationships um, could be salvaged, but struggle to find how to make it work. Some are faced with family bonds which cannot be broken, but which are the focus of grief and unhappiness for which they feel that they have no answer. I have met people who say they feel stuck, unfulfilled, underutilized, underappreciated in one employment but choosing to stay in an, in an employment, but choosing to stay, marking time, so to speak, but always longing and looking out for the big break while giving little attention to the current task. I have met others who unceremoniously dumped one frustrating job only to find the next one was no different from the one they left behind. Dr. Ernest Holmes has an answer to such situations, which he articulated yes again in this very little, uh, useful little book. And it is now available for free on the internet. It's called Questions and Answers on the Science of Mind. You can download it for free, a gift of Religious Science International. And a question. I am in the business world, but I have been trained for and love the artistic in the realm of music and drama. How may I get back into the world I love? Answer, treat that you are now in the place that best expresses you, which will give you the greatest degree of happiness, which will perfectly express through you divine wisdom, intelligence, and love. Place yourself in unity with your desire and stay there until it objectifies. So having decided that you are able through divine wisdom to express yourself in whatever way, if it means walking away from a relationship, walk, walking towards whatever you think you will get when you leave a relationship, whatever it is, walking towards that creative expression you didn't have. But when you are finished, be very clear of your goal. And then, what he means by unify with your desire, spend time thrilling to it, feeling it, knowing it is mine. It is mine because I'm free to choose it. It is mine. The great Chinese violinist Ning Feng when asked what his secret to success was, he said, I don't have a goal, I have a direction. What on earth could he mean by that? What could he teach me about how to approach my life? That is a goal. A goal is just a node along an upward spiraling path, which has no ceiling, 
<laughs> Remember when the sky was the limit? That is before we knew what was beyond the sky. When hitch your wagon to a star was enough of an encouragement? Guess what? That was yesterday. We now know that there is an infinite reality far beyond anything that we can see with our naked eyes. In the same way, there's an infinite reality to anything that we could experience, far beyond what any goal that we might set. Our direction, my direction, whether I'm aware of it or not, is not towards, is, 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 is towards peace and joy and the awareness of my connection with the presence of God. It is spiritual growth. We may say that we want things or experiences or to escape things, but beneath all of that, that infinite presence, that divine wisdom and intelligence is nudging us, nudging us forward. So when we set that intention, of course, goals will come after spontaneously, but the goals will be appropriate to the direction that we are going in. Now, what do you believe to be the greatest handicap to man's spiritual progress? Someone asks, a lack of belief in the actual presence of spirit as directing and law as obeying. We must work, plant that in our minds, that there's a presence and a power that is within us, and there's a law that must obey us. And we keep at it and make that part of our daily devotion, to recognize that. And whenever our minds goes off track, we come back to be still and know the salvation of the Lord. The salvation of the Lord, meaning that will deliver to us the freedom, the happiness, the peace we desire, and an intimate relationship with the indwelling presence of God. So. Friends, train, we must train our minds to be in a constant state of wonder, of awe and gratitude for the privilege of being the unique expression of this awesome power, this intelligence, this projector of magnificent beauty, this generator of serenity, peace, and poise, which is our lives. God is beneath every form and whoever practices to love that presence of God which we cannot see must love God's creation as it appears in ourselves and in every other self we meet. To love God is to love ourselves. To love God is to love humanity. And let's start with the self that we know and out of that we will have acknowledged the God present, but first we must know and believe that first thing, that the presence of God is within us. The presence of God manifests as us. We are the evidence of the presence of God. And when we get bold enough, we are the presence of God. So Dr. Holmes says the control of the mind is the first step towards spirituality. That's what we are after. The first step towards any change begins with a firm and definite decision to make that change, to go in the direction of a, of a closer walk with God, for the, uh, to live in righteousness, meaning the righteousness of our minds. And Dr. Charles Barker um, reminded us in his collective essays in a class that's going on now, take that decision, once you have taken that decision, everything starts rolling on. All, everything comes into place in your mind to lead in a direction. So take a decision to fall in love with God and you will fall in love with you. And when you fall in love with you, then the whole world seems ever so bright and beautiful than ever before. Moving in this direction, we treasure and enjoy each step along the journey without worry, without impetuousness, without haste. For he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, 
He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And I will say to you, as we begun, so we continue. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Stand still and behold the glory of the Lord. Very simple, very straight, one line, we can remember it. It brings us back on track. Try it. This is your week's work, and so it is.